One of the biggest discriminations that people with disabilities face, not only in the climate movement, is just not being considered, not being thought of, being ignored. When you have, like, people will list out the communities affected by the climate crisis, and I so frequently do not see people with disabilities on that little list. Hi everyone, this is Aletta, founder and creative director of Our Climate Voices. Climate Change is Personal is our new podcast, where we're listening to people's personal experiences with the climate crisis and learning from their wisdom about how to create a future that is resilient, community-based, and centers the leadership of people on the front lines of the crisis. For those of you who are new to our climate voices, we are a collective led by young, queer and trans folks, BIPOC and disabled people working to humanize the climate crisis, catalyze systemic change, and vision the future that we want to make real. We know that climate change at its core is a social justice issue rather than an individual consumer problem. We also know that the oil and gas industry and other powerful interests have profited off of climate lies for decades and invested in strategies to convince us to fight climate crises as individuals rather than as a collective. Those in power know that we are more powerful together and they are afraid of us acting collectively. So, we mobilize our personal experiences with climate change to hold those who profit from the climate destruction accountable, and we share our collective wisdom about how to embody a resilient, interdependent, and just future. Today, we're here with the inventive Izzy Latterman, a 17-year-old disabled climate activist with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Izzy's mom and grandmother also have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and Izzy has seen firsthand how hard it can be for people with disabilities to be taken seriously by medical professionals. Climate change is personal to Izzy because as someone who often walks with a cane and is reliant on dependable access to medication, her disability makes her vulnerable to extreme weather events that are increasing like blizzards, hurricanes, tornadoes, and wildfires. Izzy takes action in her local community, advocating for disabled people to be leaders rather than tokenized in the climate movement and making climate advocacy work accessible. Izzy, we're so grateful to learn from you today. My name is Izzy Latterman. I use she, her pronouns, and I am currently 17 years old, and I live in Minnesota. I am disabled. I have a condition called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Basically, it just means that my body doesn't produce the protein collagen correctly, so all of my connective tissue is really loose and just like not the way it should be and that can cause a whole range of problems um and the biggest one for me is that i have chronic pain and it's really bad the most debilitating pain that i have is in my hips because that can prevent me from walking effectively and cause a lot of mobility issues i also have like carpal tunnel in my wrists and my arms are have pain my neck and my back. It's just kind of all over and because Ehlers-Danlos is all of your connective tissue, it's like all over. But yeah, so that is my main condition that I have. And then I had like a three, four year long medical journey to get that diagnosis. And like I, I had so many different diagnoses that didn't wind up working out. Like I got diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, but then that wasn't completely accurate. So while that journey was happening, I I I had a really hard time, even though I definitely was disabled. Like I had those disadvantages. I didn't identify as disabled because I didn't have like an official diagnosis and to necessarily prove my disability. But once I did start saying, okay, well, I am disabled. I have this disability. I am disadvantaged. I need accommodations to be able to like do the best I can, like specifically in school and all of that stuff. My disability, Ehlers-Danlos, comes from my mom's side of the family. Um, So my mom has a more mild version of it, and my grandma has a more severe version of it. And Ehlers-Danlos is progressive as time goes on, so it gets worse and worse, which explains why my grandma has it so bad. She, She, like... Um, people with Ehlers-Danlos are at increased risk of osteoporosis. So my grandma has Ehlers-Danlos, osteoporosis, lupus, and like a whole bunch of other issues. So she definitely has 
it. And so she actually didn't know she had Ehlers-Danlos until I got diagnosed with it. And then my mom like was like texting her. She's like, you know, you have all of this stuff. You should definitely look into it. And then her doctor was like, wow, that actually makes perfect sense. <laughs> so it and like, I'm really grateful that I have family members who have like some of the same experiences as me because Ehlers-Danlos is a genetic thing. At the same time, it can also be frustrating because sometimes we tend to think that our experiences are the same or like uh, like my mom will be like, you can do this because I can do this. And I'm like, actually, I can't do this because it hurts. So they're not the same in that way because everyone's experience with disability is different. Even if it is the same condition, it's still different. It's honest, it is really nice though of having that support. Like I, I know that I identify as disabled, but I don't think my mom does. I, I don't know if she does actually. I haven't talked to her about that. She has never indicated to me that she does identify as disabled. This moment actually happened first. It was when I officially got my diagnosis of um, Ehlers-Danlos. So it took me a while to get there. Um, and I had, um, I met with this new doctor who was amazing, who is amazing. Um, and she just like, I checked all the, all the, all the checks on the list of Ehlers-Danlos. And then that's when I started thinking about how like I had previously been involved in like the climate movement. Um, and I knew that um, marginalized communities like the BIPOC communities were disproportionately affected by the climate crisis. Um, but I had never heard anything about people with disabilities. And when I got that diagnosis, I, I started identifying as disabled. So I was like, okay, I should look into this to see if this is a thing because I know that other marginalized communities are affected. And that's when like I researched it and I looked at all this information and I realized how affected we are, my community is by the climate crisis. And so that like really horrified me. And what really, really horrified me was that it just wasn't talked about. And so that was a very pivotal moment for me of like realizing this was an issue and that this needed to be talked about. But I, I also still felt like a little awkward because I was like, well, I live in um, Duluth, which has been named one of the two cities safest from the climate crisis. Like I, I have immense privilege. I haven't really faced like any of this, this like stuff that people who experience hurricanes and all of that would face. And I, I'm also white passing. So I have that an immense privilege as well. But then I had the second moment where I needed to go to the hospital and there was a blizzard and that was certainly made worse by the climate crisis. And I had a really hard time getting there. And that was like kind of a moment where like, wow, it, it isn't just other people, like it, it's me too. And so it became like, and that's why I created a lesson plan and I created disability awareness around the climate crisis and I created the webinar plan once the um, pandemic happened so people can get educated about what they need to do and what the issue is. And hopefully those climate movements that were not inclusive of people with disabilities, they will be inclusive and that that's like one goal. But another goal is just like the everyday person who may not be involved in climate movements is will become aware of this issue and then can be a support network, can be a care giving network, and that can save a life. I see two different therapists because I have uh, mental conditions. I have anxiety and depression and then OCD. And my anxiety and depression are much more under control than they used to be. And so I have a therapist who's like helped me with that. And then I also have a therapist that specializes in people with chronic pain and like the mental repercussions of that because being in chronic pain can be, you know, very mentally taxing where you're like, you can't do the stuff that you want to do and it it's really hard and it it's especially hard with my OCD where I I'm a huge perfectionist and I need things to be perfect and so when I can't do something because of my disability that can be really hard so that's why I see this therapist it wasn't like life or death kind of situation where I needed to get to the hospital but it was still pretty important because I had been not you know 
not having the best time. I'm definitely the kind of person that needs a lot of vitamin D sunshine to make me happy. And it was the middle of winter, so I was not, you know, getting my my needed amount of vitamin D. I was not feeling the best. So I really wanted to go meet with my therapist. And the night before, there had been a huge blizzard. Like, there was, I don't even know how many feet of snow, but it was several feet of snow. I, I remember because my cane, I have a cane that I walk with. I remember like sticking in the snow just to see how high it was. And it was almost all the way to the top of the cane, <laughs> which I thought was really funny. And so like the issue with the roads was not only that they were snowy, but that they were icy. And you know, that can be really dangerous of like car accidents and all of that. And like people were like having to drive really slow um, and like it was advised that you don't go out but like I really like my mom asked me she's like do you want to go to this appointment is this something that you want to do and I'm like yeah I need to go I, I need to just like talk through stuff right now so my mom got we got in the car and I just remember like slowly going along I remember like slipping on on the ice I remember um like like not spinning out but like just slipping a little bit and it was like really scary and I was like this is not typical but it's like it's not unusual for Duluth to have snowstorms and have this but like what was unusual that was that I was having to go to the hospital and like it was hard for me to get there and so I was just thinking about like this made me feel really hopeless because I was like well if I'm experiencing that where I'm in a really big place of privilege where I'm in a place that's not affected by the climate crisis extremely then you know like that other people are not are having it so much worse and that just made me feel really helpless because I was like well this is it's affecting me and it's affecting other people and it's affecting them worse and I don't know what to do about it and that was like a really like big moment where I was like I have no idea what to do because I am just one person and I'm also disabled and so I I need it's even harder for me to you know do this stuff because I need to take time where I can just rest and let my body heal as much as it can and I can't always you know like we have these big strikes and marches and all of that which are amazing like I can't always participate in that because I can't always stand for that long and like you and like the climate movements that are doing a lot all of that that are doing a lot are not including people with disabilities and so I was just thinking about all of this stuff and it just made me feel so so helpless and hopeless and and it was really hard for me to just be in that moment where we're slipping along to get to the hospital and we did get there and I just re I remember there was like barely any people there like there was so little people and I remember some a, a lady came in and she was in a wheelchair and she was like her wheelchair was covered in snow and I was like you know this is <laughs> this is you know it's not just about me there's like so many other people who are you know also experiencing this where they're trying to get to the hospital in the snowstorm and so I, I wound up getting to, I wound up going to the doctors and I, I kind of, I did talk about like my hopeless feeling. And so when I, we came up with some like action steps of what I can do to like make myself feel less hopeless, to take care of myself, but also like take action, you know, because um, it's important that I take care of myself and take care of myself is like, can be taking action, but it also needs to be like just taking time for myself where it's just myself I'm just focusing on myself and getting better that's really important is that like taking care of yourself is so important and like self-care is not selfish at all like it's needed and so then we went home and we saw all these people like digging a car out and we were like a little confused and what was happening and my dad went to go see if he could help and then that's when we found out that it was our neighbor who needed to get to liver dialysis i don't know what exactly he had but it was like it was it was a life and death thing for him 
for me it had not been but for him it was a life and death thing and my community my neighborhood came together and we had a bunch of people dig his car out from like four feet of snow five feet of snow i don't even know how much snow there was but there was a lot of snow (laughs) so he could drive and get to the hospital and you know that's what that was for me that like kind of made me feel a lot less helpless because that was you know a community came together to help this person and like you know that made me feel very safe because I'm sure if my family wasn't able to the community my neighborhood would do the same for me and like I am incredibly lucky that I have that and I know that having those support networks as people with disabilities are reliant a lot of us are reliant on support networks people push the goal of independence but like even people without disabilities are reliant on support networks where you need your family to help you out you need your friends to help you out you need your neighbors to help you out every once in a while and that's totally okay and it's and it's really important to have those support networks but that also just made me think about like people who don't have support networks or people who are disconnected from their support networks if there is like a disaster where they are like separated and so it's great to have those support networks and have those solutions where you have your community coming together and helping but there's still times where that might not happen and you still need to have solutions for when that does happen and so that kind of really pushed me to action of like you need to create policy you need to be create action steps to help people and one of the biggest things that I also thought was important, not just policy, was that making those people who could potentially be the support networks aware of the issue so then they can help people in the future. Because I've learned that you cannot you cannot always rely on the government, you cannot rely on policy because that will not always be inclusive of everyone and it might not even just happen in, in the first place. And so educating people about the issue and what they can do about it is for me what gives me the most hope because when those people know that they may have to dig their neighbor out of the snow, their car out of the snow so they can get to the hospital, they may have to check into them and say, okay, I see you can't go out of the house right now. Let me get your medication for you. They they may see that like knowing what to do is something that can be incredibly important and save lives potentially educating people about what is a support network what are the issues people with disabilities face in the climate crisis and what are some solutions that was what became extremely important to me so then you can have because so then people can have hopefully the same privilege that I did where my mom drove me and then the same privilege of my neighbors digging out my other neighbor from the snow. That was why that was such a pivotal moment for me because I realized that it's okay to feel helpless, but I'm not helpless. I guess I guess is what I'm trying to say is that I'm not helpless and I can do something and what I can do is make sure and do my best to ensure that people have the same privilege as me and that privilege is having support networks and so it became like and that's why I created a lesson plan and I created disability awareness around the climate crisis and I created the webinar plan once the um, pandemic happened so people can get educated about what they need to do and what the issue is so I wound up creating like not really an organization but much more of like an informational page called Disability Awareness Around the Climate Crisis, or um, DAACC. And what it does is it's just a group of people, um, and it was originally just me, where we create like informational graphics. We have a in-person lesson plan, and we have a webinar plan of like a lot of just like information that's easy to share, it's accessible, that you can just share with other people and spread it. And so then people can learn and work to make those things inclusive. It's also just like, cause you know, when you have um, people within climate movements who are disabled trying to fight for things, fighting by yourself can be really, really hard and people might not take you as enough as seriously. So then they can say, well, I'm a part of disability awareness around the climate crisis and 
this is what like you need to do to make it inclusive. And then, then you just have that back of like a wall of support that is this organization to help help push people to m- include people with disabilities. So I um yeah, so my mom, she's she's half Filipina and I am a quarter Filipina. And I am white passing. I do not identify as a person of color because I have that immense privilege of being white passing and I'm also I'm also like not you know, I'm not very Filipina. I'm only, I'm um, just a quarter, um, but it is still something I very much culturally identify with where um, my family, well, we, we will cook the food. We, we, um, I like making homemade lumpia with my family. <laughs> it's very fun for me. And um, it's much more, for me, it's a very, it's a cultural identity. It's a big part of my mom's story definitely she grew up very um she grew up poor in the valley of la in a mixed um, family household and a mixed race household and with an immigrant father but honestly my mom is like a really incredible influence of mine because i like i said before i'm really passionate about education and like educating people about how they can help my mom is actually a teacher she's a she teaches well Now she's teaching mostly high school, but she usually teaches middle school and she's like a social studies teacher. And my dad's a history professor. So I got a lot of education going around in my house. Um, And they've actually really helped me like know what I want to do with my life. For a very long time, I wanted to be a politician. I wanted to be um, a disabled politician who kicks butt and fights for people with disabilities. And then I was like, you know, that's a lot of work. And like personally, I my condition is most likely going to get worse and worse. And so I kind of just want to do something that will not stress me out that much, that will like still help people. And so this actually happened because I was really, I watched this movie called Crip Cramp, Crip Camp, A Disability Revolution. And I recommend that everyone watch that. And I learned about this disability justice history that I had never learned about in school, ever. I had no idea that so many people fought for things like the ADA for 504 and all of that. And you know, this is something that extremely definitely affects me because I have a 504 plan in my school that allows me to have accommodations that help me do better like for testing, for homework, and like even like on my plan is that I can just, I, well, I can leave class early just so I can walk through the hallway and make it to class in time because I'm a slow, I sometimes when I, my hips are acting up, I am a much slower walker because it hurts for me to walk. And like, so that's something that I need. And I just learned about these amazing disabled activists who fought for that and like I owe them my accommodations. I owe them a lot of the like the rights that I have today and I I never learned about it. And so watching this movie, I felt like extremely empowered learning my history, learning about these incredible badass people. And so that actually kind of inspired me to like want to be a history teacher. And so I I definitely changed a lot. I went from wanting to be a politician, like a big politician, to wanting to be a history teacher, which was a big change. But I thought, you know, like this is still a way that I can help people. This is still a way that I can like empower people because learning my history that I never learned before empowered me. It made me feel amazing. It was so incredible. And I want to do the same to so many other students. I want to teach Black history. I want to teach Latinx history. I want to teach disabled history. I want to teach queer history. I want to teach Asian history. I want to teach Indigenous history. Like, I want to, like, I have ideas of, like, opening it up because I want to teach American history of, like, the first couple of days instead of, like, starting right off at, like, colonism like so many teachers do i want to start off by inviting in a guest speaker from wherever i'm living at this time who is um a member of whatever um indigenous tribe is whatever land we're on just so i can like really start out with teaching from a decolonized um 
point of view. Like, that's, like, something that I'm just, like, really excited about. Um, and so it's having my mom, who is a social studies teacher, who also has this condition, is also just, like, really incredible for me to, to, like, know that that's something that I can do. And, like, I will certainly need more accommodations just because that's the way my body is. But, yeah, so that's something that is very nice. And my, my grandma, actually, who I was talking about earlier with, who has um, Ehlers-Danlos as well, she was a teacher and then a principal at a school. So, like, education, just, you know, continuing the Ehlers-Danlos family line and the teacher family line, I guess, is what I am planning on doing and already doing. <laughs> The relationship between disability justice and climate justice is huge. Like, I remember the first time that I actually taught my lesson plan in person was at the December 6th strike in St. Paul at the Capitol building. They had teach-ins there, and so I taught a disability one, and I forgot to bring a sign, and so they had they had pizza there for lunch. And so I was like, okay, I need to sign so like people know who I am and people know I'm the I'm the disabled girl who's teaching about disability issues. So I stole the back of a pizza box. That's not true. I didn't steal it. I asked permission and they said I'm sure it's fine because they're not using it. I am not I didn't steal it. But um I took the back of a pizza box and I wrote disability justice is climate justice on it in Sharpie. And I, I still, I'm actually looking at the sign right now. I have the sign on my wall in my room. It's a makeshift sign. You can tell it's the back of a pizza box, but you know, it. the message is very, very still very true for me. And I think, and true for every, everyone, is that disability justice is climate justice. I started thinking because I was already active in climate stuff in my local area specifically around like clean water and all of that but i i knew that i knew that marginalized communities were affected worse and like faster by the climate crisis like i knew bipoc communities were affected but i had you know never really heard anything about disabled communities so i had no idea if this was like a thing and so then i i started researching it and like you know what i found horrified me that i and what horrified me the most was not necessarily what happens to people with disabilities in the climate crisis because well that is horrible it's very it can be very similar to other communities what horrified me was that it wasn't wasn't ever talked about i had never heard anything about it and so i just i looked more and more into it i saw how people with disabilities are displaced by the climate crisis especially in like coastal communities and how that can be so much worse than those for who are able-bodied because of lack of accommodations lack of medication access you know there was a woman in hurricane katrina who drowned in her own bed because she was unable to evacuate. And I was just reading these things and I I was like, how come I've never heard about this before? And then I read that a lot of people with disabilities, when you have these people evacuating these storms, those with more severe disabilities were even being institutionalized against their will. And that that is just like a gross violation of human rights because those people don't you know necessarily need to be institutionalized i don't think that escaping a disaster with a disability warrants being put in an institution where you know you have so many institutions that have rampant amounts of abuse it's just not acceptable reading this all of this i i really started thinking about like why isn't this talked about and i kind of made it my personal mission to make sure that it was talked about I think that what able-bodied people do need to do in the climate movement is include people with disabilities. That is like the biggest thing. Like one of the biggest one of the biggest discriminations that people with disabilities face not only in the climate movement is just not being considered, not being thought of, it being ignored like and everything that it happened like everything and not just in climate movements, but climate movements, especially think people who consider themselves climate justice movements and all of that, 
need to include people with disabilities. And so having not only people with disabilities as members, but as leaders, because nobody knows disabled issues more than someone with a disability. And so having a leader or leaders or all whatever who are people with disabilities is so important. And I think that another thing is just like, like a first step maybe would just like, when you have like people will list out the communities affected by the climate crisis and i so frequently do not see people with disabilities on that little list and i just like a first step just adding people with disabilities to that list can set it up so that you are including us more and more in the future yeah that's my one thing like just include people with disabilities learn about the issues educate yourself make sure that you're your all of the stuff that you're doing is accessible and inclusive make sure you're having disabled leadership all of that stuff disabled members and i think that disabled leadership is so incredible and important because disabled leaders understand that you do not need to be productive 100 percent of the time people need breaks taking care of yourself having self-care is so important and people with disabilities a lot of uh, like most of us like really understand that and like we cannot so having the disabled leadership is also having someone who would not expect you to be productive 100 percent of the time and so that you can take breaks when you need it um yeah and i know that disabled leadership also just ensures that a lot more things will be inclusive and people with disabilities understand that accessibility um, is not just one solution, but it is multiple solutions, and it is multiple solutions so that somebody, you have one solution or a couple solutions that will work for, at least, at least for you, like, where, and you can see this in, like, the Black Lives Matter movement that's happening right now, which is an incredible movement, and you have so many people, Black people with disabilities, helping lead this movement because that's so important, or because, you know, Black people with disabilities are, like, So people, black people without disabilities are like three times more arrested, more, more, three times more likely to be arrested in schools. And then you have people with disabilities that are not, that are any race, not necessarily, who are also three times as likely to be arrested. But when you have black people with disabilities, black disabled people, you are, you go up to like five to six times the amount of likeliness to be arrested in schools. And so like, that's why it's such a connected issue. Um, and so you have like the Black Lives Matter movement, which is a great example of multiple solutions making it accessible because you can protest, you can provide supplies to protesters, you can um, sign petitions, you can make calls, you can write emails, you can um, donate, you can do all of this stuff. And like you should be doing multiple stuff if you can, but you have, and there's so many more things that are happening. All of these solutions they're not like they you can't just have one solution because that would not fix things but when you have multiple solutions working together that makes more progress and it's more accessible because people with conditions may not be able to go out to protest but they may be able to donate and they may and they may be able to sign petitions and write emails um and people may not have money to donate but they can go out and like collect supplies for um, protesters to help help like give them supplies like there's so many different solutions to this issue that like so many different solutions they're not like solutions that are fix everything because that there that can't that needs to be done by this like abolishing the police and all of that stuff but like t- to help make move this along to help the people leading this movement to help the people in the movement there's so many different things that you can do that someone can do and that's what makes it accessible and so using that in climate movements where you have a bunch of different solutions of what you can do instead of just one thing is something that people with disabilities understand is necessary to make it accessible and so that's something that people with disabilities can definitely provide um, and why it's so important and it's also just important so that we're included and we're made sure to be thought of because even in spaces where people were like, even in like climate movements, you know, it wasn't talked about. They would have 
their like their stance and like their um goals and all of that and i ne- i never saw people with disabilities really ever included in that and ever included in those goals of like um you know they would have like a just transition of like to green energy but they wouldn't consider you know people with disabilities in that and how we like a lot of us rely on medication and that medication comes in plastic bottles and like all of that where there's just like little things that may have made this movement inaccessible to people with disabilities and even just not being included made it extremely inaccessible and so that was really frustrating for me just not seeing it where we had so-called progressive climate movements so-called like climate justice movements where people with disabilities weren't included and so i just really wanted to work to make sure that they were included in these solutions because you know these climate movements they are doing a lot where they are you know, making policies and fighting for them and getting attention and all of that stuff where they are doing a lot and people with disabilities need to be included in that. One of the really good examples is is eco-fascism, which is like the idea that like people dying for the environment is a good thing, which is so, so, so wrong. And like, especially because the people dying are going to be minorities, are going to be people with disabilities. With eco-fascism, people, like, with the beginning of the pandemic, like, the skies were clearing, um, and all of that stuff, pollution was going down, which is great, don't get me wrong, but when it comes at the cost of, um, people's, you know, dying and, like, this horrible pandemic, it, it's not great, it's not, like, by itself it's great, but it's not by itself, it's, because of this and that's not okay because it's gonna be people who are predisposed and all of that who are dying and it and we've already seen that it's uh, that um communities of color are dying at higher rates and you know that in itself is connected to the climate crisis because things like pollution disproportionately affect communities of color where you have a much higher percentage of people of color specifically black and latinx who are living close to um like a gas plant or a coal plant and you know that causes pollution and that pollution causes those predispositions to like diabetes and asthma all of that which can make you get hurt worse by the coronavirus can be connected and is connected to the pollution that people face and so those people have disabilities because of the climate crisis because of that pollution well and that pollution is the cause of the climate crisis and then when they get if they get coronavirus they are affected worse because of their disability and because of the climate and because of the pollution and then you also think have things like where people who have disabilities who have like a hard time regulating body temperature which is something i definitely relate to and you know people with disabilities experience disproportionate poverty like um because you know it's legal to pay us under minimum wage but that's that's a whole that's an issue that I could go on about that I'm not going to, um, that we may not have access to air conditioners, and this is especially when places that have warmer temperatures, people may not have access to air conditioners and they can overheat. So a solution to that for a lot of people was to go in public places like a library, like a grocery store or something like that where they had air conditioning so they could regulate their body temperature. But then you have the pandemic, and so these people who have disabilities have a hard time regulating body temperature are therefore at increased risk of being harmed by the coronavirus, cannot go into public to regulate, to get the air conditioner to help them regulate their body temperature and not overheat, can't go get that. So then they're they're at risk either way. And that's just like another example of how interconnected that is with other things. And then like for a final example of that is institutionalization. So people with disabilities, especially um, uh, BIPOC people with disabilities are institutionalized and people with more severe disabilities are institutionalized against their will during the climate crisis because like, in I'm using the finger quotation marks, the government doesn't know what to do with them. And so they institutionalize them against their will. And you have these institutions where rampant abuse occurs. 
And with the coronavirus, these people who are getting institutionalized, a lot of institutions are not required to disclose how many people in the institution have coronavirus. And by institution, that can be anything from an insane asylum to a mental health facility to a nursing home. And it depends on the state, it depends on where you live, but a lot of these places are not required to disclose if who has coronavirus, how many cases they have. And a lot of them are closing down from visitors from the outside, which means that there's no witnesses to see or prevent abuse because people can't come in because of the coronavirus, which means that the people in these institutions, a lot of whom are cognitively, mentally, or and or physically disabled, are potentially being abused with no one to watch it and could have coronavirus and we have no idea. And that's also connected to the climate crisis where people are being institutionalized because of things like they have to migrate due to the climate crisis. So it is all connected. That, like, even just in that one story, you have um, elder elder abuse, where you, potentially, where you, um, and that's, like, an, a justice issue. You have institutionalization against their will, which is a human rights issue in general, and also a disability issue. You have disability justice. You have the climate crisis, so climate justice. You have racial justice, because this disproportionately affects Black, Indigenous, and people of color. And... You have stuff related to the coronavirus, and then, like, and all of that is just interconnected. And this is because of systems that are in place that perpetrate this kind of, these kind of issues. You know, ableism, racism, xenophobia, homophobia, transphobia, all of those types of bigotry are extremely interconnected because they're all perpetrated by colonialism and capitalism. Because capitalism perpetrates the idea that one's value is based off how productive they are, which is inherently ableist. And then you have systems like capitalism that are racist from the beginning because of the history that we have that people of color, black people, indigenous people, and people, other people of color may not be, have the ability to be as productive or may have disabilities and, or, you know, may have disabilities. And so they, they are considered, and we are considered to have less value. And that is why we, people can get away with like institutionalizing us and doing all of that stuff. And that's why when the pandemic started, when people were saying, oh, it's just the elderly and just the already people who are predisposed, people who are already immunocompromised, we are seen as having less value because we are not as productive. And that is not ableism by itself. That is capitalism perpetrating the idea of ableism. And the same thing with like racism. Racism and ableism are so intertwined because you have the idea, the racist ideas that people of color have less value. And that is so interconnected with ableism. So all of that stuff is not something that you can just pick, like pick one and separate because they are so connected. It can never be disability justice versus climate justice. It can never be disability justice versus racial justice because they're all connected. They're all intertwined. So for me, a good, like a good future is that where that instead of blaming the individual for stuff like that, those corporations, well, my ideal future, those corporations would be abolished and like replaced by other system, other things. But where you have solutions that are um, not pressured by the individual to sol- fix them, but by the place that creates them in the first place, that they're creating those solutions. And I guess for me, I mean, ideally the climate crisis would not, would be solved and like people you'd have public transportation that's accessible and you'd have um a lot more like mutual aid and working together and hopefully capitalism wouldn't be a thing anymore but i don't know for i guess for me that for like a disability justice future that 
for like for me is that there's much less like stress like must much less put on individual action and rather systemic change where it has to be those systems that are enacting the solutions rather than the individual hello again this is kari slaughter director of design at ocv Thank you all for listening, and thank you, Izzy, for taking the time to share your wisdom and experiences with us today. I had a great time mastering and scoring this episode. Thank you to Aletta Brady for interviewing Izzy. And thanks to Abby Haley, Angel Nwadibia, and Amaya Sangarima Jimenez for their editing support. I forgot to mention it last time, but thank you to Cindy Santana for creating the cover art for this podcast. As always, a massive thank you to the rest of the OCV team for their consistent and valuable support to our dedicated community. If you want to engage further with OCV, you can find us on Instagram at Our Climate Voices or on our website at www.ourclimatevoices.org. Stay tuned for three more episodes about the intersection of disability justice and the climate crisis in the coming months.